So thanks for joining. Today we want to show you how to pay less for your healthcare, and uh, it's going to be a lot of information, so please interrupt. We have a learner, Tim, who's kindly agreed to uh, narrate the internal monologue we all face when trying to learn new stuff. And the, far, the more we transform data, the more confident we are and the more we lose sight of that internal monologue. So throughout, whenever you hear something confusing, just throw up a hand and ask us because the goal is to help you access information that affects your health and the health of the city and eventually the rest of the country. But for today, because it's the New York City School of Data and we're focusing on hospital data in and around New York. Tim, do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, my name is Tim. I am, um, together with Jan, we're working on a foundation. Uh, I'm basically a designer and an anthropologist. Um, what else I really want to say, other than you know, really what we want to try to do with this workshop, which is a bit of an experiment, is actually do the stuff, access the data. Uh, I think that's what we're doing. We're accessing some public data and we're going to transform the data and we're going to visualize this same data, make it meaningful and different information. And we can make decisions about like which hospital to go to, which treatment is the cheapest or the most value. And that. There's a lot of technical jargon in there, and I wanted to try to humanize the people to provide it. I think before we dive in to the uh, to give a little context, we'll, we'll sort of try to describe the problem state a little bit in these few slides. And then once we actually get into the workshop part, uh, I'm curious to ask, I don't want to interrupt, uh, just break down or whatever you feel. The, I want it to be useful for all of us. And so if there's a lot of stuff you already know about how to do this, you might. I don't. I know very little, actually. There's a lot I do know. But there's a lot I don't know. Me too. And so, yeah, we want to um, try to get it done. But we'll give you a little context first, and then admit that you know I certainly know next to nothing, and mm -hmm. there may be like really obvious things. Just shout out and say, "Oh, you should do a different thing." But um, as I understand it, the session today really is about accessing some public data, transforming the data, visualizing the data. And the extra bonus is that we share that information as meaningful information with people so that they can make better decisions. Yeah, and about myself, anything else? No, what did you say about yourself? I'm just Tim. I'm I'm Jan, and we started this uh, organization called the One Fox Foundation together. Our vision was to provide free healthcare by 2030. And we're doing that using artificial intelligence and machine learning because it's a way to achieve scale with very few resources. So it's a way to deliver information to many, many people around the world using a small amount of money and a small number of computers. And some of the reasons we're doing this as a nonprofit instead of a for-profit entity, it's because we don't want to reinforce the existing system where hospitals, insurers, drug manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, pharmacy benefit managers, all the players in the healthcare space it's very hard to know who is incentivized to do what. Because as patients, we might want to pay less for our healthcare, but hospitals need to make money and they're at the mercy of insurance companies as are drug manufacturers and pharmacy benefit managers and employers. And so it's a very complex set of laws in the US. Like if you're an employer and you have more than 50 employees, 50 or more employees, you have to buy health insurance and your hands are kind of tied if some one of your employees, one of those 50 or more people has a serious condition and has to go to the hospital. Like if one of your employees has a C-section and it's an emergency procedure, they have to be hospitalized, their baby has to be hospitalized, that hospital bill is going to be up to you to front. Or And then if you have an insurer, a health insurer, then that health insurer is going to push those costs back on you. The next year and, and they're gonna this, this description the you here is the, the employer yes yeah, yeah. about 50 or more yeah and then you and the employer that business owner is in that position yeah and that's all to give a little bit of context of here's the current state of the world if you're if you employ anyone in the united states then you have to by law buy health insurance and then the health insurance company will charge you more if one of your employees gets very sick and so say you're a fire fighter union, then firefighters do a lot of this stuff. So then their back gets hurt and they need back surgery. So then their explanations of benefits 
when they file for health insurance to deal with those back surgeries, that'll be very expensive for the firefighter union. And so that cost that is borne by, say, a firefighting station or a firefighter union, that's up to the employer to negotiate with the hospitals. And you see how there's already two, three, four levels of remove from each one of us, unless we're like sole proprietors of LLCs or we we opt to be uninsured or we happen to be on Medicaid. A question? From an employer standpoint, if they have a bunch of employees and you know some employees are just more sick than others, that actually affects the, the premium costs um, for the employee or for the employer. And for the employer. And then, um, yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. For the employer. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know that. And so it's a very simple set of things, and it's very hard to explain it. And so, let me try. Yeah. I I'm not being stupid. I'm not for stupidity. Still, use artificial intelligence any day of the week. The One Fact Foundation, we have an ethos, we're doing a lot of different things with this idea that with one tiny fact, we can make systemic change at a large scale through applying machine learning and other fancy tools to these large sets of data. Within One Fact Foundation, we have a product or service called Payless Health. Payless Health is focused on this thing we're talking about now. There are quite a few different scenarios for different users. Basically, I don't know if we can go to the next slide, ready to do it. It's a search engine. You go and you say, hey, what's the best place for me to get the cheapest eye operation of this kind? Hit submit. And all sorts of magic happens with large language models and stuff when we're making sense of data. The decision maker, maybe it's a, a patient, maybe it's a hospital administrator, maybe it's an employer of a certain type of company, will hopefully be empowered to make the right decisions for them in their, for their own company, and this will have a systemic effect of, of basically bringing down, in this country, in this system, prices. That's basically, I think, at a mm -hmm. high level, what we're trying to do. What kinds of inputs are you getting for PLS help? Like, what's going in there that's helping drive the company? Uh, public data. Yeah, so oh, basically, like, so that's... The entire internet is central here. Uh, public data. Yeah, so oh, basically, like, so that's... The entire internet is central here. The parts of the internet that are relevant to hospitals, health systems, insurers, and patients uh, in the United States. Uh, and then the goal is to build it all open source and do the same thing for other countries if it works in the US. And maybe, why don't we run through for like literally 30 seconds the- uh, One slide. more question. Oh, sorry, yeah. 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 Which angle? Like we did the conversations that we've had with healthcare model or like, because like, you know, like obviously, it doesn't matter what you're saying. But countries that like there might be different. Yeah, I take that. Yeah. What do you want to answer that question? Um, I I think given the complexity of um, I I think given the complexity of the different incentives of like a doctor needs to make money, a patient needs to pay for care, insurer needs to reimburse claims that were made for their. For their health care. That's the US centric. Yeah. So I think your yeah. question, I really appreciate it. So within that system, then I don't pretend to understand the full extent of it. And I don't know what the effect of releasing this information will have fully. We're taking our best guess at trying to reduce the price within the current system, but there's no way to guarantee because we have no data on other similarly sized health systems. But we're trying to reduce the information asymmetry of like health. Was it yeah. like that funding? Yeah. Um, with KLS Health, like, is this is this something that's meant to change the system or want to the system? I think more of this. Yeah, I think it. it my I don't. I don't know because I can't really. I can't fully define the system. My answer. I don't I don't know because I can't really I can't fully define the system. Yeah. Uh, My else to be looking at for payless help in the US. Me personally, I feel the root cause problems, it's a for-profit system. So ultimately what we would like to do is transform the system. However, as stepping stone strategies to get there, there are things we need to acknowledge in the near and sort of midterm to enable employers in these situations to actually start getting there and so part of the, this first part and what we're talking about today is dealing with the existing system but hopefully it's part of a larger strategy eventually 
at a global scale within a whole bunch of systems of systems, you know, complex dynamic systems and systems, find the right nodes to manipulate and, and make that systemic change. But I love the question. Yeah, so as, as an example of like, I don't really know, like I disagree with Tim that the root... Yeah, so as, as an example of like, I don't really know, like I disagree with Tim that the root cause is that it's a for-profit system. Because I grew up in Canada, so I experienced a single-payer system. I have Estonian citizenship. I'm a visiting professor in Estonia, so I also have lived experience there. My dad was born in Sweden. I lived in Australia. I've lived in London, worked at DeepMind. And so, I disagree, you know, profit systems and Singapore and Spain and the UK and Brazil and yeah. countries that are supposedly, you know, shithole countries that actually have like way better healthcare than we do and this supposedly, you know, shining light on the first world. world country where people in that, yeah. yeah, rich, like, like the developed. first world country where people in that, yeah. yeah, rich, like, like the developed north, yeah, yeah exactly. So it's Great easy question. to, it's easy to yeah. point out problems. And I think the dialectic is to do as much as possible in an open source way and really ask that question of like, what do we think will happen? We want to pay less for health. And do we know that's going to happen? We don't know, but we can at least do our best to give you guys information and yeah, and this yeah. is the conversation you and I are having, and that yeah. we're building and doing this stuff, like the, the sort of. Like, what, I think what, it's great that it's for profit because I think otherwise this data would not be released, and it's the only country in the world where we can actually do this right now, because it's for profit, and there's so much money to be made off of class action lawsuits, like say for C-section rates, for outcomes, for Johnson and Johnson selling asbestos then that's possible and kept up by the system of checks and balances at the Supreme Court level, where lawyers make so much money the moment you find a little piece of data that's discriminatory against a certain protected, legally protected class of people, whether it's by race, by gender, by income. So that's personally why I disagree to some level, but I think it's an ongoing conversation that requires these fora. Another question? Solving everything everywhere is more so making the facts fair, and just because facts are true and they're uh, what was said earlier today, stubborn, good things inevitably happen, which will ultimately lead to a good system. Is that kind of the? Yeah, I think I want to make some. Also, keep track of time. Yeah, because sure, yeah, 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 yeah. I do like the focus of this talk is supposed to actually be the doing of it, mm -hmm. and, and it's great conversation. I, I want to set the context and maybe show a couple of the other slides just to talk about the mm -hmm. problem space we see for Payless in terms of the U.S. But I think, yeah, the one fact foundation, which is kind of the overarching foundation, the healthcare is a space that we're working on. It's a problem in there, but ultimately, yes, I think. Whether we apply to transportation or education or privacy or disinformation, there's a lot that we can do uh, with the tech and yeah. with the approach that hopefully is something like what you're sketching out, which I understand. You find a very salient one that's kind of salient fact, and you can work with that to make a larger systemic change. Yeah, I think I would, I would abdicate on whether it's good. I, yeah, I think I would, I would abdicate on whether it's good. I would just. I think the reason we're doing it as a nonprofit is because we're not fully confident in the effects. And so we'd rather build artificial intelligence and large language models out in the open with a very clear source of where money's coming from, where money's going to enable traceability so that if there's any harmful effects, it's made public as quickly as possible. Okay. Our goal is to get the pay less health, like pay it one double entendre in the name is like zero to zero dollars like literally pay nothing so yeah. we're like trying to get there but i think we abdicate on like whether this is the right approach and by all means if y'all have a better idea then we should talk yeah um, for sure so this is this is a bit of that landscape that i painted for you where the government is at the top receives the least amount of data and in terms of Patients, patients are all the way at the bottom where they have, like we all have the most broad percepts of our own disease state or health state. We're aware of what's hurting, what's not. We communicate a little bit of that to our providers, our doctors who might go to a yearly physical if we're lucky to have a general practitioner or family doctor. And each step of this data journey means 
communicating something and transforming the data and reducing the amount of information that's communicated. Like if you know your history for an entire year, you don't have time in 15 minutes at your yearly physical to say all of that to your doctor. You might have charts, you might have notes, but even notes, like notes that your doctor types into an electronic health record, that's a compression of what you've told your doctor. And every time you go up one level, say like hospitals might share data with health information exchanges. And health information exchanges might sell data to insurance companies. And then insurance companies sell data to life sciences and pharmaceutical companies. And then the government, in essence, gets the least amount of data. And we'll see some of the data the government has on hospitals in New York today. And this is just to set the context of illustrating a bit of this information asymmetry of but like this river here is asymmetric. And it also has a cute little story behind it where in public health, there's this anecdote of seeing people dive into a river to save a drowning person. And you kind of go up the stack and then you're like, well, why, why is a doctor diving into the river to save a patient? Like why is, and then you look upstream of the problem and then you try to see that, oh, maybe there's a hole in the fence. Like maybe if we fix the fence, then so many doctors won't jump in and drown to try to save the patient. And so this metaphor helps me think about like what's asymmetric, how upstream is it? Is hierarchy of medicine part of the problem? Again, I don't know, but I, I can point out the facts and the stubborn the stubbornness of the facts of like, yes, medicine is hierarchical, training is hierarchical, bedside manner is very hard to design for at scale and um, so i worked for a few years as a i think the title was experience architect or whatever but basically dealing with the us and the patient experience in the national health service in england and as basically our job was to get digital information through to a variety of different users including the end users of patients who we would call them um, and, you know, we have carers, we have also GPs, all sorts of different users, but, um, you know, in different places, even it's, it's complicated, it's complex in every place because we're dealing with personal information, private information, health records, and, and all the, every, a lot of things and more that you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Let's skip through to like, it's, we acknowledge like data is only going one way, the, the money is really, we've got a problem because certainly in the US, at least from our point of view, you know how it is you show it if you didn't have people to show up and then you always have to pay something somehow even though you're supposed to be covered for it yeah so the patients see the least money despite having the most contact for it yeah so the patients see the least money despite having the most contacts about their health and giving up the most information about their health and so we can look at this from a real estate point of view too like medicaid or medicare covering nursing home stays and then get a sense of a country and a country's status of like, where can you go for housing and healthcare? Whether or assisted living facilities, there's about 45,000 of these. But there's various ways you can slice and visualize the data. Uh, we've, but there's various ways you can slice and visualize the data. Uh, we published this paper with the first public data set of assisted living facilities. And it's another example of incentives where if you're on Medicaid and you're almost forced homes, and then your group home owner gets a $700, $800 a month check from Medicaid, from the government. And you might experience a lack of agency from the government. And you might experience a lack of agency because this data is just on a GitHub repo. It's on an online cloud storage system that very few people know how to access. But we have published this paper. It's public. But we're slowly figuring out how to design and make this information more accessible and helping people to make decisions. Like, should I stay in this nursing home with a high COVID rate? Or should I go to this assisted living facility where there's a lot of people being sent there from a psychiatric ward or from a jail or from a prison? So these are just some of the complexities that come up when you're trying to think at a national scale. This is some of the subtleties of what happens when you go to the doctor, you see your doctor type in stuff, 
then there's an entire team dedicated to billing revenue cycle management and clinical documentation improvement. So essentially how the hospital gets money for every minute and every word that you tell your doctor. Your doctor will transcribe it, a physician will attach codes to it, or their team will attach billing codes. Like if you've ever looked at your explanations of benefits, you'll see some codes, but it's CPT codes, ICD codes, doesn't matter. There's an entire team that's searching for these codes and trying to find like, what have we not billed for? And I've helped build some of this software that helps hospitals make money by finding codes they haven't billed for. Because a lot of hospitals will go out of business unless they do this efficiently. And so it's very, very complicated. You can see the number of different entities involved already. So, so far what we have is a nonprofit bill analysis tool, some users, some potential partnerships. And so the interesting thing is that we're able to collect a few thousand hospitals uh, price sheets. That's thanks to a law that was passed in the US government in 2019 called the Hospital Price Transparency Rule. And that forces hospitals to post their prices. And so that's the main data set that we're gonna look at today. And we'll share a link to a co-laboratory notebook that's in the Python programming language that'll help us visualize all of this data here and focus on New York. On New York. <clears throat> and we actually got this featured on Hacker News, which is great. And I think in the interest of time, we can dive right in. And I just want to allude to the potential things we might do to try to answer some of the questions that came up of like, how do we know it's working? Or like, how do we know we're operating within the system or outside of the system? I think it's to trust the patients more or trust each other more. And so this, this is one example marketing campaign we're thinking of running with the Link NYC system. Link NYC is those boxes where you might see people charging their phones out or making phone calls. They have Android tablets and they have digital displays. And so this data here. And you can see the Rangers hockey scores. Yes. And you can see cute fun facts about New York. But <laughs> the facts here are not cute, unfortunately. The facts here are like your hospital kind of charges a lot or a little or has good health outcomes or not. So that's what we're slowly building towards of like, what's like the equivalent of like a ranger's pack for your neighborhood, especially if you're in one of these hotspots with high concentrations of households that have $50,000 of household income or less, or households that are on Medicaid. So I don't know, how's everyone feeling? As a learner, I'm kind of feeling like I kind of, I don't know if it's fair because I've been talking about this and listening to it, but I kind of feel like I kind of really get the context and there's lots of big things going on. <laughs> I'm kind of impatient to dive in and like access the data and transform it. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah. Data? All right. Yeah. Let's do it. General access. Restricted. I just want to share it with people. Share it with who? Everyone here. So they can follow along. Uh, really? Oh, here we go. Now we got it. Now we got it. And so what should we call this, like, so pay less? Let's just call it pay less health. Call it pay less CUNY. They got help. All right, fine. Pay less CUNY. Yeah. So that's that's the link. You can go there and follow along. Pay less CUNY. But that's the, that's the rest of the time we have, which is 20, 30 minutes, enough to give you a sense of like, here's how to work with this data and answer any questions you might have. So. Do you even know what like EBT is or like Gulf Hub itself as a platform? Everyone's, some people. Some people do. Who does, who does know Gulf Hub? 
for like DBT, how many people have DBT? Only two, so that's so that means yeah, only two. So I'm going to this yeah. I'm going to this bit.ly slash hey less cuny. Very small. Yeah. Here let's be on there. And so here we have some introductory information. Let me see if I could zoom in a little bit. Yeah, so this is this session we're at. We have goals of the workshop, how to access this data using the command line, using Python, um, how to look at the first few lines of those 4,000, 5,000 hospitals that we have data on. Uh, so wait, first, we're going to look at the first few lines of some files. I'm just looking at the outline on the top left on screen here. Yeah. Over here. And then we'll see how to count the number of hospitals using whatever the government thinks is the number of hospitals. Um, we'll look at hospital quality data like how many people go back to the hospital within a 30-day window? What are the rates of C-sections or infections or bloodstream-acquired infections? And then we'll access data used to define, like what do we mean by New York? This is the school of data.nyc, but depending on who you ask, New York can be defined in many different ways. So we'll see one definition with the Census Bureau. What do you call that so that in terms of like... Um... Like, what are you doing then when you're saying you're defining, like, it's like a geographical, it's like you're bounding something, or like, is like, what does New York mean to you? How do you define it? But in terms of like the steps of accessing and then transforming data, what what part is that? Like, is there, is there a technical term for when you're like bounding or like, I'm not sure what to call it, but like, it's like it's def kind of defining data. New York uh, so a machine can understand what we mean when we say New York. So just enabling us to like build a more specific and precise query. Like that little map that we saw for Link NYC stations, yeah. and you saw the hotspots for like households with fifty thousand dollars or less in income and people on Medicaid. So is it like the difference between like saying like, "Hey, I'm going to define New York with like a bunch of zip codes," or yeah, like, exactly. Or can I define New York by like drawing a, a geographic? We're going to see both. GIS description. Okay. You nailed it. Thank like you. one is the Census Bureau defines these core-based statistical areas. We'll see that definition, and then we'll see the United States Postal Service definition using zip codes or yeah, zone improvement program points. numbers. I'm, I'm rich on time a bit here, man. I, I know, I know. We're getting there. I see the outline. I think I get it even. But... And, then, and then we'll see another way of defining New York, which is like in terms of latitude and longitude or GPS coordinates. So you can plug into Google Maps or Apple Maps or OpenStreetMaps. And so after accessing the data, then we'll see how to transform it and link these things together to make a map of New York hospitals, see what their price is, and see what the health outcomes are. And then we'll visualize this on a map. So those are the those are the high level steps we'll go through. So accessing the hospital data. We maintain a cloud storage bucket on Amazon S3. That stands for Simple Storage Service. And you can see the contents of this Amazon S3 bucket here. And here we called it hospital price transparency because that's the name of the federal rule that forced hospitals to comply or else get fined. So every hospital here, you could just download the data. There's there's about 4,000 different hospitals prices here. And you can see it's not that human readable. Like this is Canyon Vista, this is reports. It's already, it already seems like a mess. Like there's a zip file, there's an Excel file, there's a CSV file. And so all these numbers, we need some way to standardize the data. And so that's why we're gonna go into how to work with this data. And everything you need is in this collab notebook at bit.ly slash paylesscuny. So if you're ever lost, just go back there and restart. 
And so you could just click on these links, download the data. I can try that with, say, like this zip file. So here I downloaded this zip file. So you're just going straight to that that S3 dot USD. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so this this is a file I just clicked on and I downloaded to my computer from this S3 bucket. How did it get into the S3 bucket in the first place? Uh, we uploaded it. Yeah. Where did you download it from? We downloaded it from the hospitals. Yeah. Yeah. For one at a time from the hospital's websites. Okay. Yeah. But it, it's part of the kind of I feel like part of the point of this whole talk is actually if I have to, again, I'm sorry, like correct me if I'm wrong, so I'm just trying to learn this stuff. Mm -hmm. like, as much and as cool as we can use like large language models, chat GPT, whatever, and, and other systems that can do like clever like get and clear and other thing. Where it's ultimately and what we're trying to do is like transform the data to make it understandable if it's all one standard scheme instead of many different schemes that each one works together are doing it. Like once it all comes in in one place and it's organized and we can make it meaningful to us, there's still as part of that process almost necessarily, almost always, if not always, some kind of manual yeah. step that really that requires and stupid human beings. Yeah. To really like look this stuff over. And so this so the it was downloaded in a somewhat automated way by first paying humans. Like we paid ten thousand dollars to humans, like anyone who joins a Discord server, signs up, submits a pull request to this database of hospital prices. Anyone can submit to this. Like if you wanted to and you see that one of these URLs goes down, you could just say, Hey, this Excel file isn't found anymore. I'm gonna add a new one. And so that's how we got all these URLs. And then that's just like on the right one, that's the goal of the link the repository, our, our repository of Dolt. Yeah. And so from Dolt Hub, all we did is we downloaded those files for the four or five thousand hospitals to a cloud storage bucket on Amazon. And that's what you're seeing in this link. It's at Amazon AWS, which stands for Amazon Web Services. Like every time you see a product image on Amazon, that's hosted on Amazon Web Services as well. And it's very cheap to store all this data there. It's about 200 gigabytes. And But as we saw, it's like, what does it mean if I download this and then I see this? So, so the government The government said that you should in the federal rule in 2019, it said that you should structure the data according to a CSV, JSON, or XML file. Yeah, with no, nothing else, essentially. Yeah. That worked. And I think the hospital, what I understand, like the hospital is the one who's supposed to publish the data. So the onus is put on, in this case, the hospitals. There's a lot of other players in the system that have the data. And so I just added this link to the federal register. And this is where, if you want to, you can find things like specifying. So this is this is in the federal register government database of federal rules. And this is it. It says examples of machine readable formats include but are not limited to XML. Like I don't know what XML means. Markup extensible language. Extensible markup. Extensible JSON. I don't know what JSON stands Another for. Another thing. I don't know what it means, what it stands for. And CSV formats. A portable document format that's a copyright closed source format that Adobe owns. Uh, would not, JavaScript object notation. JavaScript object notation and a portable document format would not meet this definition because the data contained within the PDF file cannot be easily extracted without further processing or formatted, formatting. And so this is section 45, the code of federal regulations, subsection 180, paragraph 50, sentence C, and the definition of machine readable. 
you see, it's it's so complicated for the government to try to define these rules and say what they are. And I think you're seeing already like the huge amount of information asymmetry that is codified at the government level. As, as designers and systemic designers, we've had this problem dealing with super large complex systems. And, and as a designer, then what I see here is a, a language problem. And we, we are all talking to each other through these codes that most of us don't understand. We don't even know what CSV really means or stands for. And, and I'm, I'm, I say we as in, you know, the system, like society, us human beings together. In oh, here's a PDF. Yeah. <laughs> I said pretty clearly, like you can't have a PDF. And I, so I want to add the The hospitals don't have the prices that they are legally required. I understand what you're saying, and that's right. I think apparently. Uh -huh. Wait, hospitals don't have prices? I'm confused. No, all hospitals have prices. Okay. okay. Okay, there's but a lot, there's a lot okay. in there to unpack. I yeah, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot in there to unpack. The, yeah. Um, there are a lot of facts. There are a lot of one little facts that are salient and, and affect things. And I think really right now, I, I want to again, like, represent the human as a human centered designer mm -hmm. the human beings sometimes just don't even know what that is like they did their best and they tried to organize the information and follow the law follow the rules and they just uploaded a pdf because they don't even necessarily know what a pdf is and at some level the information you know in one hospital everything is perfectly organized and paper and they had a system for 20 30 50 years and it runs perfectly but then trying to like put all this together is is really difficult and so yeah they're working on it and, and, and others mm -hmm. and we're getting there but yeah, thank you for being an analyst. <laughs> yeah. yeah I am. Right. Another question? Um, another bounty just to clean up all the data and get it right into one schema. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you for thank you for saying that. <laughs> We're uh I forgot to add that link, but we are Maybe. doing a much Maybe. bigger bounty. And so this is something that at the one fact foundation level, we're raising money. Um, will part of the way we will spend some of that money to put up on more of these data bounties for pay less health and we'll be also some of the other products and services when it's a bird. And so here's sorry? Sure. I just added that. Oh, where in the collab? Uh, at the top in the introduction. I think it might take a minute to refresh or something. Yeah, it might take a minute to refresh. Uh, just go yeah. bit.ly slash Pay less CUNY. And so this in this new data bounty, we go through all these issues with it. We propose schema, but as as you just pointed out, um, do all hospitals use this? We don't know, but so we can try. Was saying this too, and as a designer, what we're often doing often with really is translating and trying to help people, like you know, like the answers are there in a lot of ways, and in the same way that like the data is out there, but no one can really access it because it's a bunch of comma separated values and like what does it even mean and why it's not, well, everything's different. And so, you know, trying to get everyone together to sort of pull in the same direction and, you know, agree on, you know, how long it took Adobe to make and, and, and put the document format, like PDF files, like, you know, the history of where that file format comes from, what's going on there. That's a huge project. And, you know, yeah, there's choices like, ethical and ethos related choices, but also right back to the choices that are open source in this problem space, for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you're, you're starting to get a sense of like, there's public data now, but 4,000 hospitals have their data there. We downloaded it to a publicly accessible place and you can click on it to download it to your computer. You can copy the link and then download it with command line tools or Python, process it in some way. And then here's some examples. Like this is the, the first CSV file in this list. You could use the wget command line program to download one of these price lists. And then so you could- one line of code in Collab right there. You just literally can- Yeah, it's a command that. line utility called wget. It means like submit a get request 
And you just need to know where that bucket is. Like, uh, you go I mean, to bucket, yeah, you right click on a on a URL. Uh, but that first step is so painful, isn't it? Just like getting the initial like files, like all these things are up there in public. Like that's exactly that's what I spent all morning doing. I'm just like and that's the cleaning this up and putting this in a readable format online. It's just a directory listing. So then here you can right click, copy this link, and then paste it in here. And then if you run this, it'll download this file to this computer running on Google's hardware and software and hardware. Yeah. And then you can interact with this file that you just downloaded with normal command line arguments like head to display the file header. And the file header is just like the talk. The first, the, the first few lines. And do, can you specify like how many, like is, is there any sort of knowledge about like, oh, I want the first three or first three yeah. lines? Yeah, yeah, you could do that. You could say head and three, and then that'll give you the first three lines. And what is that language you're writing? Is that FTP? Uh, which language? I don't know. You just wrote dash n. Dash n. So that's a that's a parameter to the command line utility called head. So head is a program. What's Linux syntax. So Linux syntax. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't know what like. It's a program. parameter for the command line program called head. And head accepts a very specific set of parameters. So that command line. Anyway, just like because what I notice as a designer mm -hmm. working with all this stuff all the time is like my logic. I'm so unfold by developers is pretty impeccable, but my syntax is horrific, mm -hmm. and that's because I never know which line. Like I just need to know. Like wait, is this Urdu speaking or is this English? <laughs> yeah, GPT solves a lot of those. Yeah, the GPT solves a lot of those problems. Yeah, yeah, like I guess you'd call this like uh, exclamation mark head dash and what language is that? Like if it's called dash. Sorry. Oh, dash. Anyway, sorry to take it off track. My homie Tim needs help with the bash. I don't know, but you can't say bash command. I don't even know what bash command was. You're cheating. Hive mind. She wants to get her more power. There we go. Love. Okay, sorry, I didn't mean to say bash. Please revise. <laughs> and so GPT is good at this kind of like small, short and stuff. Would, like my question was just like, what language is that? Uh, this, this is. Uh, anyway, let's get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> I wouldn't say it's a language. These are parameters for a command line utility. But surely that's within some yeah, sort of structure. Like yeah. I trust well. Uh, yeah. And so this is another way to download the data. You could use a Python library called requests. This is an HTTP library. And then Colab is nice because it gives you hints about what everything you're doing does. And so if you lose your place, you could see, see what it does. And here's some code I wrote where you can do the same thing you just did in the bash unix command line language in the python programming language and so here i'm taking the same url that i got from the amazon s3 bucket and submitting an html get request http get request sorry and then i'm writing the response and the content of that http yeah, response doing like an html get versus like doing one of these sort of import requests like by http so request is a Python module. It's a library in Python. It doesn't... It's doing the same thing. You're accessing the same S3 bucket. Right? It's doing the same thing as this wget. Yeah, so is there, why would I do wget versus doing this Python? We don't know. There are different tools. There's no... Yeah. There's no pro or con or so. Depends on what the goal is and what you're trying to do. I think there you get. You can have it stored locally on your machine. So if you're accessing it repeated times, it can be faster in processing. Whereas the other way, you're running with a Python memory. It sort of depends on the machine you're running. Okay. But for a large file, it can be slower. Thank you. So with the with this um, Python way, I'm not actually downloading to my local. It's more like in this other library. Right, right okay. in the memory of the, the Python. Okay. Thank you. And so this is that's another way to look at this data. And 
following up on that question, then here's yet another way of getting the first few lines of a CSV file without downloading the entire file. It's a, it's a lot of data, and then you can actually stream the data. And streaming just means reading it line by line, so then you don't need to download the entire file. And not everyone has, say, 200 gigabytes of storage for the hospital data. So you could still analyze the data without downloading everything to, to your memory or to Google the memory on this Google machine we're using. So you just skip the whole WBAP stuff. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, what did I do? And so this is, this is now in like the Python programming language. These are lists being returned. And this is what we'll need to use to transform the data to a common format. And the Dolt Hub data bounty URLs, that's just go here. That's the only instruction. Like you could you could copy and paste the URLs manually as well. That's another option, or download them from, from the Dolt Hub database. And this is just for counting the number of hospitals. Or is this this is still for the hospital accessing hospital data, like the price lists. Yeah. And then for hospital data. Where did we go? Uh, right now we're at hospital quality data. Yeah. The step before that. It was video, but what is this? Some um, the pandas Python library. Oh, uh, we're not there yet. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you. So for the hospital quality data, then. We can get data from the government on how good hospitals are. And so this wget command that we already learned about is pulling information from data.cms.gov. And this, this, this file here, it's for the New York, New York core based statistical area defined by the Census Bureau delineating the boundaries of New York. And so these are the quality metrics for hospitals in this area. Let's see. Yeah. So here we, we use something called Pandas, which is a Python library for data analysis. And I think here I'm just making sure that these are strings, these provider identifiers. I'm setting an index. I, I don't know. I think it's just like characters or can they be numbers? I think it'd be, I thought a string was just letters. No. Can they be numbers and letters? <laughs> numbers and letters. Numbers and letters. Yeah. No punctuation. Encoded in different ways. Encoded? Uh, I don't know what that is. <laughs> Thanks. But I do have a question. What's your favorite quality measure? Yeah. Uh, Early in the surprise. <laughs> uh, the, the, the question is, uh, name is like Let's see if we have that. So, <laughs> so <laughs> wow. So, oh, this is a big bit pandas data frame. So, I'm going to hospital quality measures. I'm just going to look at the columns and see if that is in there. It, it was, is this all like, is it oh, really? Yeah, I was going to ask. It's so quality measures. I mean, unless you're specific with mental health providers, like, yeah, like the patients. I don't know what I don't know what about it. Is there like a master list of all the qual hospital quality measures out there in the world? Yeah, it's right here. Well, it's really hard. It's basically, it's whatever you're interested in. And if you're a hospital, I don't know what to look for. I don't know. I don't know what to ask. Like, I'm interested in I eyes. Sorry. And CQA, the National Commission for Quality Assurance, they put out a lot of healthcare. The US News and World Report, they put the things on billboards of like number one. So it really depends who you talk to of what does quality mean. Yeah, I would press the billboard out of like a thing. That's what I'm trying really? to Really? But it says number one. <laughs> but I'm not stupid. What do you mean? I just say you said no, natural started. stupidity. For real, like what are the hospital quality measures? Like I see, like these are some of them, right? Like, yes, the agents. So the agents. It's still almost the, meaningless to yeah. <laughs> The H one is the survey that um, helps out us. 
So that sounds nice. That sounds worth putting on a billboard. And HCUP data also has like data. Like once you're done with the pricing and you're ready to move on to actual costs, you can get like actual costs. <laughs> wow. Um, I'm confused why you guys switched over to the hospital quality data as well as a bunch more stuff about defining the area. And then it seems like you never actually returned to the pricing data in this sheet. Like, what is the goal here? So, here it's to map all hospitals, their costs, and their quality in New York City. But and then, so we're going through the steps. For first, we access the data, uh -huh. and now we're ac we access the hospital quality data from the government. And now we're, we can decide on time, like, do we want to see how we define the New York area? And then how do we map it? Because in order to, to present hospitals and say that score, I already forgot what it's called, the HCAP's overall hospital quality rating, in order to list that on a map, so that you can click and see on the map, like what's the HCAP score of New York Presbyterian or CUMC or New York? So I'm just feeling another like the bottleneck sort of friction point where, because as like a, I mean, we sketch up the employer example, but like as a patient, I just want to know like where's the cheapest place for me to go to get this operation done. Mm -hmm. but, and that would be somewhere within one of these quality metrics, or would that just be a price? These quality metrics are unrelated to price. And right. well, and this like, why did we start looking at quality? Exactly. We start price? Uh, because we do have quality here. Like our goal is to map the hospitals, their price, and their quality. Because if you just look at price, you might go to an overpriced hospital with very bad quality. But in here, you never actually find the price back, right? Or you don't have that yet because that's sort of the value you're trying to explore. Um yeah, where do we get the, like, what's the cheapest, and, like, we can map so, the most expensive on a map. So that's where we'll get to, like, in this map of just, like, being able to link the hospital prices to their outcomes. Right. I guess I'm just saying, like, I feel like that doesn't count, but, but I think I know what you're trying to do. Okay. Yeah. So what would be helpful next? So going through the New York thing, because we're almost at time. Uh, I think, like, I think you're getting the hang of this. Like, this is a lot of downloading things from this is from a census government website to map things in the New York, New York, Jersey City statistical area. That's what, say, the US News and World Report uses to compute those rankings of what's number one, what's number two. Um, you need to map those to zip codes. So, that's from the housing department and the government. So you get a list of all zip codes. You can map those to latitude and longitude. And then you can map the hospitals to their latitude and longitude coordinates. And then you can map, say, the, these provider numbers to their quality measures. And so it's a lot of information, but we're at time. I'm just showing you how to go through the steps to do what you're asking, which is how do you get from a provider number, like say these 176 items of centers for Medicare and Medicaid services that are now in a public place linked to prices and display them on a map with their latitude and longitude. And will this, will this workshop be available like, if I went to do it like Oh, for sure. Yeah, yeah. Like that's our that's the main goal. We're doing this, and so here at least you can see a map where you can see like for Richmond University Medical Center, the 473 beds, the readmission is 15 percent in a 30 day window, which means that people will like 15 percent of people will come back within 30 days, and so if we wanted to, we could go to this bucket and find this hospital and then link that number like 15% to the prices. And so that's what the rest of this notebook does. Yeah, but for sure, our email, our emails are here. I'll add them. And will this change greatly? Like to pay no. less or pay less CUNY, Bitly pay less CUNY will pretty much be this. Yeah. Ask, yeah, thank you so much, everyone. And I would say, you know, um, if you're interested in helping, whether it's the data bounty or, you know, in any way that you see, like obviously, okay, less needs help, and there's a lot that we can do and we are doing, but it's still very nice. There's a lot of good application of this stuff.
Yeah. So if you have any ideas on like your favorite quality measure or something that you care about, then let us know because we can't, we can parse the like outpatient mental health codes and then link them to measures of quality. And we can even compute our own measures of quality from the claims data we have and the electronic health records data we have. So it really, quality is up to us to define. Like if you're interested in inpatient or outpatient mental health, then we can help you do that. Yeah. I had a question. I used to work for a couple of FQHCs in down in India. What are FQ? Federally qualified health centers. Federally qualified health centers. Okay. And my work was basically making these reports that you're trying to tell, like the uniform payer sources where you can get information about. Sorry, you lost me. Uh, what are payer sources? Uh, is called UDS reports. UDS? Yeah. So all the companies, basically the federal qualified health center, community health centers, and, and different facilities which are being supported by Medicare and Medicaid. Uh, they have to report their reports to HRSA. HRSA is a company made by the government. HRSA? Yes. And the uh, different tools that you're seeing, basically you can see all that on HRSA. Like I've been doing that for a couple of years now. And is it open source? Is it yeah. public? Yeah. Oh, amazing. Uh, this is also my thesis for my master right now. Amazing. Work for us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right now. Amazing. The doing. I feel like all of this stuff is already being done. Yeah. But it's being done on like by the government. And nothing is being done on the private side. So I don't know if you have seen those tools, like the mapping that you've been doing for the system living, all this stuff. That, that's like pretty much available online. Maybe. So there's a map I could find that is like this with the readmission and the price? Yeah. Yes. Amazing. And from the, from the hospital URLs for the price sheets. So all these hospitals, they have to give these UBS reports to HRSA, and that's how Congress decides like how much funding each of So HRSA has a has a publicly accessible for every database. Yeah. Amazing. So, so it's only for companies which are uh, which come under like Medicaid, Medicaid, yeah. which are getting their funded funds from the states. Right. So basically, how Congress decides how much funds we're going to get for different states. So it's for every hospital or just some? So whichever covers with Medicaid. Medicaid. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah. So I don't know what the, the I thought the federal rule applies blanket, like to everyone. No, not at all. Oh, okay. Mostly for people who are getting funded by the Congress. Oh, okay. So the assisted living and the, all these managed long-term care providers, which is like assisted, all these different. I, I was working for a MSC supervisor here in New York also. So what was I say? MSC is a managed long-term care provider. Thank you. So the, all these assisted living, all this stuff was like under their brand. Yeah. So all this stuff is pretty much like available online. Like it's not that hard. Amazing. Yeah. So that'll save us a lot of time. And then we can just make a search engine. Thank you. So uh, this one, uh, my question was, I think it's like, how is that different from the model that's already like the government has in place? I think it's a question of how easily can you search through it and give it to patients? Because like we talked about at the start, the information asymmetry is that, it, like, as you saw, I'm using government, we're using government websites here to map everything. But the goal of what I've seen is usually to help insurance companies like third-party plan administrators or help hospitals or help provider networks negotiate to make more money it's not aimed directly at the patient so i'd say that's the difference of just making sure that there exists an open source free alternative that's for all of us to decide that's why we're trying to put it on link nyc so if there if there is something where like people are putting it on link nyc and making sure it gets to disadvantaged communities that need to make decisions, then we don't need to do our job. Like, please tell us. And then we shouldn't do go forward with this. The first is on any acronym, actually. Ultimately, it's really, really difficult for most normal people to really make sense of the information or, or just even access the data and make sense of it. So it'd be really hard for either an employer or a medium-sized business or a, an end patient. And once you get to that higher level and subject matter of experts like yourself, then it, it is really important we all need to work together to, to do stuff. And, and the, the, I think, I don't know what the difference the models are, but from a business operating model, there is actually a, a, quite a different outcome that we're looking for. That's actually a question that I had is, I work kind of in a similar field, uh, and one of the, the main issues of doing that is educating the general public. 
on how to not necessarily the, the data, whether the data is out there and consumable. So that, that's the easy part we can do it with machine learning and coding is how can we make the public educated enough or knowledgeable enough to mm -hmm. actually use that data you know, in a user It's a way. human problem, that's right. And so as this is why um, it's behavior change. Like the reason I'm interested in this project is because at a large scale and what I do for other companies, it's basically behavior change. And in the topic of health, it's loaded in lots of ways, but I agree so much with what you said, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so what are what are some solutions that you think that you can like that over uh, How much of your job is going to be education? Most, most of it is education. So that's why we're building help pages. And that's written by patient advocates for patients to negotiate, to overturn denied claims, mm -hmm. or to get out of care network covered. And then I, I foresee using AI in that. In that Feel free to stay around and chat, by the way. Let's yeah. say I see everyone well, else. That, that, sure. I really appreciate it. Get in the thing. If you can help us, if we can help you. Yeah, I would love to discuss about this project. Like, if you need to help with anything, I'm very like, that's pretty much what I'm doing. Like, Amazing. Say it. Say it. Yeah. Nice to meet you. Say it. A pleasure. Yeah. Oh, I want to help as well. <laughs>